facilitating the successful execution of high-quality multi-center trials has become an important initiative of EAST. In this online EAST Minute, we would like to briefly highlight some pearls and pitfalls for those members interested in designing, recruiting, and successfully executing an EAST-sanctioned multi-center trial. So what is an EAST multi-center trial? EAST MCTs are investigator-initiated, prospective or retrospective, patient-oriented studies. These studies are sanctioned by EAST and supported and monitored by the EAST Multi-Center Trials Committee. The MCT Committee reviews all submissions of multi-center trial applications, offers peer review critique and suggestions to improve feasibility and scientific merit, and approves studies as EAST sanctioned. Once accepted as an EAST Multi-Center Trial, the MCT Committee helps connect primary investigators to participating centers via the EAST website. Once initiated, the MCT Committee actively monitors these studies by routinely communicating with PIs and solicits feedback on any potential limitations or problems. Of note, while EAST provides these supportive services, PIs must rely on their own institutional or extramural support to cover direct and personnel expenses required to execute these trials. Upon successful completion, presentation, and publication, trials carry the brand of an EAST multi-center trial. Over the past several years, multiple EAST MCTs have successfully been executed and carried through to publication, including loop ileostomy and colonic irrigation for C. diff, transfusion blood type outcomes after massive transfusion, and the application of universal screening for intimate partner and sexual violence in trauma patients. We've asked Dr. Brandon Bruns of the University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center, an experienced EAST and AAST multi-center PI, to offer his top five pearls and pitfalls for carrying out an EAST multi-center trial. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. These are a few pearls that I've put together based on some of my experiences with these sorts of trials and also sitting on the multi-center trials committee. I can't take credit for all of this either, as uh, specifically Joe DuBose was one who really helped me as I was getting started with uh, the SHAPE study. One thing you have to be prepared to do is to communicate ad nauseum with centers that are participating. You both want to reach out to them for participation individually, and then after initiation of the study, I recommend following up with them on a monthly basis via email, phone call, text, at meetings, whatever it may be, just to make sure that everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. You'd be shocked that uh, perhaps, speaking from personal experience, one of my studies looked at emergency surgery bowel resection. There were centers that were enrolling trauma surgery bowel resections. And I could have avoided that by more frequently reminding them what they were supposed to do. Also, I find that that communication can motivate other centers to want to participate and want to add participants. Um, you know, it, Mayo was the top enrolling center in shapes, and I used them as kind of the bait to let other centers know that this is the benchmark and you should try to try to reach it. Joe DuBose gave me this piece of advice, and it's uh, starting a separate email address for your study. If your inbox is like mine, you are already blown up with medical emails, friend emails, uh, spam emails. It gets kind of ridiculous. So create an email that is unique to your study. Uh, when I did the shape study, I think it was shapes at gmail.com. Uh, Brittany Eicher has done one for a study that we're currently doing. So I just really think to keep your emails separate. Also, on the off chance that you switch institutions uh, during, at least there is a, a centralized email. Um, going back to kind of what I mentioned earlier, in your... Uh, ongoing communications with the centers, it's probably a good idea to remind them what types of participants you're enrolling in your study, inclusion, exclusion criteria. Uh, you really cannot give them too much information. Regarding authorship requirements, uh, EAST, I believe, has authorship requirements for multi-center trials already outlined. Two per institution, I believe. Uh, you need to make sure that everybody knows uh, what you are promising, and you also need to take into consideration what the journal where you're submitting, 
uh, the meeting, etc. For the AAST only allows a certain number of authors, so some people get left off uh, the presentation authorship line. Is it going to be by enrollment? Uh, is it going to be your friends? You also probably shouldn't put 15 authors from your institution if they're not truly contributing, uh, because then there's not going to be room for other people. Uh, just think about those types of things beforehand and make sure you're up front with participating centers. Another place I got burned in the past was when authors start out at one institution and then leave, uh, their institution tends to take credit, if that makes sense. So institution X, I had two authors we'll call them A and B, they left and they went to institution Y. When I asked institution X who I should put on the author line, they gave me two different names. Uh, I then had authors A and B asking me why they weren't on it, and I explained why. But, you know, these tricky situations can arise. Uh, And this seems obvious, but you really need to have a complete data dictionary and data collection sheet prior to starting. Once you start enrolling... It's probably not a good idea to then change anything. Uh, It gets complicated, it gets confusing, and it makes it look like you don't know what you're doing. Do a rollout. Do a beta testing of your enrollment criteria uh, or your enrollment tool just to make sure it works. Ask your friends at participating institutions or people that you really value uh, who have experience with research to give it a whirl. Make sure it uh, makes sense. Let's go to the pitfalls. A lot of those were included in the pearls. Um, Again, you can see that I got burned on this with uh, the staple versus hand sewn anastomosis in emergency surgery. But you need to, for for the integrity of your study, you need to make sure that everybody's enrolling what you think they're enrolling. So I think that's where it comes to frequent follow-up, updates, who's enrolled, how many, um, if you have any. I, I'm co- participating in a big multi-institutional thing called the CLOT study right now, and uh, the PI of that study just sent out a really unique uh, patient that kind of reinforced why we were doing what we're doing, but it also reminded you of the inclusion-exclusion criteria. So just something to really follow up on. Uh, Again, the pitfall that I mentioned here, the PI author institutional transitions. If somebody leaves the institution where the participants are enrolled, uh, unless they really took a lead, unless you knew they were leaving, unless they gave you follow-up instructions, it's going to be hard to include them because really your contact is going to be at the institution where those patients are being enrolled. Um... This is a huge pitfall that really I don't think you can do much about. But data use agreements and IRB issues are variable at all institutions. I have been doing primarily prospective observational trials with no problem for my IRB. We do not require informed consent. Uh, It's no issue here. That is not universal. So there are some institutions who will come to you saying, you know, my IRB, my IRB wants me to get informed consent, to which all I can say is, I'm sorry that's the case. Um, you know, either that institution needs to get informed consent or they can't participate. There's really no way around it. I've had people ask if they could submit retrospective data instead. In my mind, that compromises the integrity of the study, and I did not think that was going to be a prudent course of action. Therefore, I suggested maybe they should not participate. Data use agreements uh, will be coming in from different institutions. Uh, You will need to get your legal people at your institution to sign on with you. Uh, You know, again, it's going to be variable everywhere. But I guess just something to be prepared for. Um, Have the statistical support ready to go. Have a power analysis done. Know what your target enrollment is. 
show your study design to a statistician before you start enrolling. These are all kind of uh, standards of good research, I think, but it becomes that much more important when you are dealing with a multi-institutional study because you have people relying on you for timely and, um, I guess, accurate completion of your study done with academic integrity. Uh, I don't think I can overstate this enough. I know that we've had some studies as a committee that have come to us and asked for statistical support after beginning enrollment and you know uh, through the vagaries of different institutional uh, politics and maybe somebody left it can leave somebody in the lurch and I, you know I think we were able to put them in touch with people who could help but if you have that lined up ready to go somebody who's seen your study I know the study that we're doing right now through East uh, looking at colorectal resection in emergency general surgery, little plug, please feel free to contact myself or Brittany Eicher. Um, you know, we have our statistician lined up here ready to go, which is something that we did not do the first time. Uh, so I think we'll be ready to analyze right away. We'll be ready to do secondary analyses. Um, we'll just be ready to go. And the time requirement really can be pretty extensive. Uh, the lead up to beginning enrollment it requires many emails, many phone calls. Um, you know, East is available to do social media ads, etc. But if you want a USC to participate, you may need to reach out to them directly. If you want Parkland, Mayo, you know, whoever it may be, um, you may need to do the legwork to talk to them, let them know about your study, follow up with them, answer your emails in a timely fashion, and make sure you can answer all their questions. Make sure they know that you are going to be reliable because nobody wants to enter into a study where they do a lot of work at their home institution and then you don't follow through. Uh, so that time requirement is important. Uh, when it comes to writing the manuscript, um, writing the abstract, you're going to need to solicit the opinions of all their authors. Um, really, that, again, the time requirement can be pretty extensive. Um, so I guess those would be my pearls and pitfalls. Back to you, Scott. So if you are an investigator with an idea for a novel multi-center trial, or even just wanting to participate in an existing study, how do you get involved? Start by heading to the East Multicenter Trial website where you can find information on ongoing and recruiting trials, as well as information and instructions on how to submit your own East Multicenter Trial proposal. If you have your own ideas, go ahead and make the leap and submit a proposal. Applications are reviewed and approved on an annual cycle in the fall, and if you're a junior faculty member, please consider submitting your proposal as part of the East Multicenter Trial Junior Investigators Award. If you're not quite ready to jump in as an overall study PI, but would like to get involved as a contributing center to an existing study, head to the East MCT website and browse the list of active studies, and then reach out to the study PI or to the MCT committee. Alternatively, keep an eye out for upcoming online virtual plenary sessions where study PIs will briefly explain their studies and how to participate, or look for badge ribbons at the East Annual Meeting to help identify current PIs and approach one of them. They will be happy to speak with you. Scientific advances in acute care surgery happen because of the participation of EAST members like you. So join in now.